The mic's not working? No. So are you ready for the question? Oh, no, we have a working, we have a working quorum. I'm trying to end work. <laughs> Um, does anyone else, we are on the manager's amendment, does anyone else seek recognition? Um, I think the, I think I owe the other side, the gentleman from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. Uh, I just wanted to say briefly that I, I want to make clear from the outset that I'm in, that I favor intellectual property right protection for recording artists. And my concern with the legislation is merely the means that the bill uses to compensate the artists and the recording labels. I appreciate the improvements made in the manager's amendment, but can't support a one-directional protection of the value of goods, the songs, over the services, the broadcast airplay, between the parties. The Constitution empowers the United States Congress, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing the, for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, end quote. Under the provisions of the Performance Rights Act, the Copyright Royalty Board may take into account the promotional value provided by the broadcasters to reduce the rate broadcasters must pay. But this presumes that the value of the songs to the broadcasters for advertising revenue is greater than the value to the artists and labels, the copyright holders, of the promotion provided by the broadcast. We do not know which value is greater and need an independent, credible third-party study. A delay of implementation of the royalty provisions may permit us to obtain such a study in the meantime, but to legislate in advance of, rec of receiving this information is premature. While perhaps the failure to grant performance right 80 years ago was a regrettable anomaly, we cannot go back to see how the relationship of radio and recording labels, or record labels, would have evolved if the right had been granted. A historical relationship of the last 80 years, though, is one of the mutual reinforcement. It is doubtful at best to suggest, quote, the music industry built radio into what it is today, end quote, significantly more than, quote, radio built the music industry into what it is today, end quote. As such, a settlement or legislation that favors only one of the parties at the expense of the other disregards too quickly the mutual beneficial nature of the historical relationship, even if that relationship has changed significantly in the digital age. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. The time of the gentleman has expired, and based on seniority, uh, uh, on the committee, the uh, gentleman from Tennessee who thinks he'll only need a minute and a half of his five minutes is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th this issue has been before us, and I've heard the comments. I believe that this is a balanced uh, uh, amendment that's been offered that gives the broadcasters uh, much of what they've asked for. If you're a small broadcaster, you are exempted. And if you are at another level, the, the implementation's put off three years and even one year for all others. It's it, To me, that's gone a long, long way. Nobody wants to do harm to the broadcasters. And true, what happened 80 years ago happened 80 years ago, but that's why we passed legislation. That's why they have what's called an annotated laws. You change laws and you make your laws reflect the societal values of today. If you looked at everything and said we did something 80 years ago, we work into it today, uh, women wouldn't be voting and African Americans wouldn't have any kind of civil rights whatsoever because 80 years ago we didn't have them and we could say we can't change. But you do change as society changes. The fact is you don't sell as many CDs and records today and what possibly per, uh, performers got out of uh, the, the radio 80 years ago or 40 years ago or whatever, they don't get today. And that can be adjusted. The broadcast in, in industry can and, and will accommodate this and should. And when you think about the monies that are languishing in Europe that could go to our per performers here in America but are not allowed to because we uh, in, con in actions that are only paralleled by Korea, North Korea, that is, uh, uh, China and Iran don't uh, allow for performers to get uh, rights, uh, payment rights. Uh, that's wrong. And many of those people are people who live in my district. I went to the Blues uh, uh, Awards program in Memphis last Thursday, and, and Bobby Blue Bland's wife came up to me. You know, they don't get any any rights. Bobby Blue Bland performs to this day. I know he loves it, but he has to. And uh, many of the performers in my district who uh, were performers at Stax and even from Sundays uh, aren't being compensated. Uh, last week there was a program on the Hill that was a really nice program. It was wonderful. The songwriters had it for some of us over in the Library of Congress, and there were about a dozen songwriters who sang their songs. 
brilliant individuals, uh, mostly men, uh, uh, white males, who sang their great creations. But when you listen to them, you realize how important the performers are, because several of them couldn't sing worth a hoot. <laughs> so we need to pr reward those people that make those songs what we want to listen to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. Lundgren. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and one of the delights of being on for five minutes. One of the delights of being on this committee is, after a number of years, um, you do get to see performers uh, come. Whenever we have these bills come up, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to say that uh, I believe that the manager's amendment is a vast improvement over the basic bill. Um, I think it moves in the right direction uh, because there are equities on both sides of this argument. The problem I ha and I would probably vote for the manager's amendment as a as an improvement over the base bill. The problem I have is this: uh, so often here in the Congress we pass laws and then we find they have unintended consequences. And I'm not just talking about in the area of uh, of judiciary, but but so many other things. And one of the reasons that occurs uh, is that we don't have all the facts available to us. And I have suggested, and I know the chairman uh, believes that we ought to um, request a study, but, but my point is, shouldn't we do a study before we have a vote on the guts of the bill? And so um, I do have an amendment that I intend to offer at some point that will give us that opportunity to pursue that. It would request the GAO to do a report in a timely fashion to give us an economic impact uh, probability study on all of the stakeholders involved, and it would also attempt to give us some sense of the value of promotion in the recording industry, because as I listen to everybody, we talk about these things as givens, but there's no quantification of what it is we're talking about, and how we establish that balance to me is a, uh, a serious matter. I, uh, I have a number of radio stations in my district who are in real economic difficulty right now. I mean, there's no kidding about that. When we had the panel here, I did ask one representative of the record, uh, of the performers, a member of uh, Smashing Pumpkins, about whether he could give me a quantification of the negative impact on creativity as a result of the failure of the payments suggested in this bill. And other than saying that we have fewer stars, he couldn't give me that. Now, yesterday I had some representatives of the industry in, and they started to give me some statistics that they would use in terms of the number of uh, a loss of the number of new acts and so forth. That's information I never had before. I never saw that before. And if that came to me just yesterday, I wonder, am I prepared to vote on a bill that has a very carefully calculated tiered system, but I'm not sure that's the proper tier. I'm not sure it does what's necessary to protect the smaller uh, radio stations and the, the uh, African-American radio stations, the Hispanic radio stations that we have throughout California. Um, and so I, I would just ask members to consider the fact that I will be in a position to offer an amendment that would at least allow us not to delay this unnecessarily, but to give us six months to have some semblance of a study so that we might be able to act on facts uh, and opinion rather than, than just opinion in the absence of facts. and. So I thank the uh, chairman for the time, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. I'm going to recognize uh, myself uh, for a couple of minutes because the, the gentleman sort of raises issues, which I think, <coughs> as one who has been very interested in this bill, uh, sponsored in the last Congress, and has thought about doing this for 25 years, um, I just <coughs> there's two separate issues. One is the right. If the law was silent, the broadcasters could go out and try and negotiate with the owner of each sound recording for the right to, uh, to have that, perfor to perform that sound recording, or they could take advantage of a compulsory license. The way this alone among anything is treated as if there is no property right, and they are allowed to use this for free. So our first objective here is to establish the principle that there is a right. Uh, and you could have studies about economic implications, and, uh, and uh, we've heard references both to a GAO study and 
and that's already been requested and one that's in this bill to understand the implications economically but if if the focus of this is on the economic condition of the radio broadcast industry you have to match that with the words of the leader of the national association of broadcast who said he would rather slit his throat than pay one penny that wasn't an economic distress argument that was that that was it was something it was something uh, a little bit different uh secondly we could talk about as you as you made reference to economic distress from the people who own the copyrights ec given the incredible level the billions of unlawful downloads and file swapping that occur every single year and the plunge in CD sales. There are all kinds of economic arguments. But no one is suggesting, for instance, that we cap what a radio station has to pay to broadcast a sports event. And by the way, the radio broadcasters can say rightfully, when we play the New York Yankees on our radio, we are encouraging fans to be more interested. We're encouraging fans to go to the game. We're encouraging fans to to get a, a attracted to different stars and buy the jerseys and all the concessions that that baseball team owns. And but we're not. We don't deny the right of the uh, baseball team and the owner of that team to get compensated for allowing the radio station to broadcast this game. When we when we hear different luminaries in radio who are getting paid, in many cases, very substantial salaries to do talk radio and other kinds of, of commentary on the radio, no one is suggesting that we, we cap what they can get paid for the economic thing. So for the economic value of, of their work, we want to establish a right here. We've been very flexible on uh, how it's paid. We're for most of the radio stations in this country, there will be no rate required for three years. For uh, the very largest ones, no rate required for a year. There will be plenty of time to get a GAO study. The question is, where do you want to start? Do you want to start by establishing the right and then understanding the full economic consequences of all the industry affected, not only the impact on minority broadcasters, but the impact on minority uh, recording artists and minority musicians and minority uh, backup singers, uh, how do you want to start this? And so I would argue it is right to start this with establishing the right, making very, very special allowances for smaller broadcasters, religious broadcasters, non-commercial broadcasters, and then taking a look at these studies. And if we have to retool this thing based on what we find, because we're certainly interested in the survival of radio broadcasting, uh, then we can do that. But I don't think we should delay this, what should have been done many years ago, the establishment of the right. Would uh, the gentleman yield? And I'd be happy to. Uh, uh, my, my issue is this. Does that not beg the question as to whether or not the value of the property right exceeds the value of the promotional um, benefit from playing the music. I'm old enough to remember the scandals of payola, the pay for play. Um, we're almost in a reverse situation now. The idea there was it was worth a lot to a performer to have his or her recording on free radio. Um, and I say free meaning Obviously, it's not charged to, to the uh, recipient of the, of the uh, radio waves. Um, and, and, and that's what I, I'm hung up on. I don't know the answer to that well, question. Could, could I retrain my time? Of just course. You're, that's a fair point. What is the promotional value to the copyright owner and to the artist from being played? And that should be one of the factors determined, as the bill provides, for in determining the rate, well, uh, well, and and that's that's the whole thing. We are not trying to turn out any appropriate consideration from the rate board. Well, we well, well, it, we welcome. Uh, we say whether the use of the service may substitute for or may promote the sales of phonio, pho, phono records or otherwise may interfere with or may enhance the sound reco co recording copyright owners other streams of revenue. That is something that that board should look at. 
in deciding the rate. I fully agree with you. Could I, could I ask yes. the gentleman to yield once more? I give myself an additional minute and I yield it to the gentleman. Would that preclude that board from making the determination that the value of the promotion to the record industry and the artists from the free um, airplay of their uh, sound recordings, uh, that that value could be, in fact, greater than the property value. In other words, the answer is yes. That, that, that rate board would have the ability to say, for even for the small ones that we cap, it isn't a floor, it's a cap. If the market value, uh, if the fair market value of that uh, is determined, considering all these factors, to be zero, that they're getting so much revenues uh, because it's being played, uh, that there is no market value to that piece of property. Uh, it's an unusual kind of conclusion because uh, those radio stations aren't doing this as a charity work. Uh, but, um, but, Mr. Chairman, but if, if, if no one hears my, my music, I've never been a performer before. I'm, I'm in my garage. I'm, I'm recording. It's kind of difficult for people to then have an idea that they want to purchase anything that's related to me. However, if they hear it on the radio station, I have had an opportunity to broadcast my product so that people might be encouraged either, and I know we, we're moving to the digital age where yes. people are saying they don't purchase it, but the ancillary um, uh, uh, articles um, want to identify with that particular artist. It, I, I guess I'm just, well, I, I just wonder if by passing it before we know what the value is, or at least an approximation of value, we are making an assumption that there has to be a positive value. Therefore, we are telling them to make a finding that this amount, at least something ought to be there. And I don't know what that is relative, again, to the value of the, the promotion um, from the free Well, side. except it doesn't seem to me fair to start out with the assumption. The value to the broadcaster is zero, and therefore he doesn't have to pay for it. And the value to the performer and the owner of the copyright is great, and therefore he doesn't need to get paid. No, what I mean by the, and, the but the under the present situation, that's that's what we've said. No, you might have two values, and, and one is worth more than the other, and the, va the all overall value of the promotion uh, is greater than the value of the product in its first instance. And that's, that's why you create, when you deal with these compulsory licenses, you create a board that gets evidence and makes a determination. I'm here to tell you, I don't care what the GAO is going to do, they're not going to have the process or the background to come to as clear a conclusion about values as a quasi-judicial entity that uh, uh, we've already created that makes these determinations where the parties haven't been able to negotiate in webcasting and satellite radio and in a whole bunch of other areas. I thank, I thank the chairman. Okay. Uh, my time has more than expired. The uh, gentleman from the ranking member from Texas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just briefly, I want to recognize the presence of the gentlewoman from Tennessee, uh, Marsha Blackburn, a former member of this committee who has rejoined us at least for a few minutes because of her longstanding interest in this subject. The uh, gentleman from... Uh, Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike the last word. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my grandmother, who uh, died when she was 106 years old, about 10 years ago, and uh, and whom I spent a uh, pretty pretty good amount of time as a uh, as a young man. I uh, used to have some just common sense maxims that I remember her for. Uh, one of them is that if you see somebody who needs help, help them. I mean, that's <laughs> she, it's, it's bottom line. Uh, and another thing she said, if it's not fair, then it's not right. And so that's why I speak out today in support of the uh, manager's amendment uh, 
to H.R. 848, the Performance Rights Act, a bill that would finally allow performers to be compensated for their hard work, uh, which has uh, always been exploited by uh, others to make money. And um, as a former musician my, myself, I understand the importance of uh, artists being paid uh, for their work on every other platform uh, of, uh, except broadcast uh, radio, uh, artists uh, receive compensation for the, uh, the, the playing on, on uh, radio of, uh, of a song they may not necessarily uh, own, but uh, they perform on that tune, and it's only right that uh, uh, they get uh, they get paid for what they do, uh, just like we do in every uh, civilized society, uh, of which we're supposed to be the uh, the, the number one, you know. And uh, so it's unfortunate that uh, we have so many people that are spreading in, uh, misinformation. Um, on this uh, issue. This legislation ensures that uh, broadcasters uh, would pay for the use of someone else's music the same way they have to pay for other services. And we can assure fair and affordable compensation so that radio broadcasters are certainly able to uh, survive and continue to thrive, but many uh, uh, are rightly concerned, uh, uh, especially uh, minority broadcasters, uh, for having to pay for what they use. We have an obligation to protect both the ability of minority broadcasters to conduct their business and at the same time to compensate the minority or artists as well as majority and anyone else uh, artists uh, that, uh, that are left out in the cold. This uh, manager's amendment will ensure that minority stations are not in any way harmed by this legislation and it requires that copyright royalty judges consider the effects on religious minority and female owned stations and religious mi minority and female royalty recipients. It protects small, rural, nonprofit, minority, re religious, and educational uh, broadcasters by providing that any station that le makes less than 100000 annually will pay only $500 annually for uh, limited uh, use of music. Um, now, unfortunately, there are some minority-owned uh, stations. Let's take, for instance, uh, uh, Radio 1, uh, Kathy Hughes and her uh, very, uh, uh, very, uh, her, her son is, uh, is a very um, able uh, advocate, uh, almost an angry advocate for uh, what they believe uh, uh, is right, which is this bill should not pass. And they've been using their, uh, you know, 60 stations minimum that they own, that Kathy uh, Hughes own. Uh, they've been using those to promote this misinformation. Tom Joyner, a uh, bunch of other highly paid talk show hosts have been employed uh, to spread uh, hysteria on this issue, and they are flat out dead wrong. I want I, w I want everyone to know that, and I'm, you know, certainly we agree on some things, but we're not going to agree on everything. And when you come, when hey. you come at us publicly, you know, we have an obligation, or at least I feel an obligation. If you're calling names, I'll does the gentleman them. wish an additional minute? Uh, 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 yes, I would. Uh, then I give it to you. Thank you. <laughs> With unanimous consent. Yeah, in consideration of our current economic climate, uh, you know, for big 
the stations, including uh, or big broadcasters, including the minority broadcasters, they uh, will only be required uh, uh, to pay after three years. They got three years to prepare for this, and um, five million dollars uh, annually is is what uh, they will pay. Um, Break that down, 1.3 million uh, a year. How many sponsors do you need in order to uh, uh, subsidize this? I would submit probably one, and that would more than uh, cover uh, this uh, uh, expense. And so uh, this won't harm the broadcasters at all. It'll help the... Uh, the performers, and uh, and I, I, I will yield back. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Chairman Conyers for his leadership on H.R. 848 and the amendment. I strongly support both measures. Uh, I believe the amendment creates an important balance that's been talked about this morning on this matter. <coughs> he was kind enough to introduce me as someone who had gone to law school, and when you go to law school, you read a lot of textbooks. Uh, what's interesting to me is that what strikes me the most, even to this day, is a history book I read called Simple Justice, which traced the evolution of the civil rights in, in courts up until Brown versus Board of Education. But it is that thought today which strikes home most of all, and that is simple justice. People should be paid for the work they do, plain and simple. And performers and artists are absolutely no different. Performers and artists do something very, very unique. Uh, for all the jobs that are out there in the world, performers and artists are a, a fraction of 1% that create from nothing art. And that has a value that's hard to put a price on. But I guarantee you it's worth more than nothing. And, and for too long the argument was held that broadcasters are promoting the music they play and that should be payment enough. I disagree. While promotional value is important, we have to remember that there would be no music at all to promote if it wasn't for the mu musicians. In fact, a solid argument can be made that radio play does not have the positive impact on record sales normally attributed to it. It instead it appears to have a negative important impact implying that overall radio listening is more of a substitute for the purchase of sound recordings than it is a complement. It was also mentioned in the introduction that I served for 10 years with Jerry, uh, the Iceman Butler in the Cook County Board. Uh, I could not go home if I didn't mention him and what he's been through. He spent decades as a soul singer and songwriter and was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Despite his decade of work as a successful performer, Jerry continues at age 70 to work every day. He has always said to me that there was a big difference between being famous and being well off. Today I begin to appreciate what he has told me. Jerry and other hardworking performers like him deserve to be paid when their performances are played on the radio. That is why I will be supporting H.R. 848 and Chairman Conyers' manager's amendment. Thank you. I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I think it's time we pass the manager's amendment and pass okay. the bill. Okay. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but only after these wise and <laughs> concise remarks. <laughs> We're told that these are tough economic times, but that's no reason to ignore intellectual property rights. The auto companies face tough times, but they have not suggested that they suspend royalty payments to those who own patents. <laughs> Newspapers face tough times. They have not suggested that they be able to publish copyright material without paying for it. And uh, radio stations face tough times, yet they have not come here and said, let us suspend the payments that they uh, were making to songwriters. Uh, the fact is the tough times really hit the artists, uh, many of whom can't pay health insurance, dental bills, and even rent. Uh, we're told that we should have more study. 
because there are unintended consequences. That's an argument I always make against any bill that I oppose but can't vocalize a reason to oppose. Uh, the fact is there are unintended consequences in leaving in force the unfair bill Correct. and leaving in force the unintended consequences of decisions made 80 years ago. And we should recognize that if we have a study, then there'll be no reason for one side to compromise with the other, uh, something uh, that we've sought to, uh, to achieve. We're told about economic fairness. I think uh, that it's wise, uh, though a new gentleman from Illinois points out, that any one artist would benefit if they were the only artist played on radio and every other artist was excluded from radio. Uh, they might even listen to me sing if that was the only thing they'd ever heard on radio. And God, that would be a terrible s No, they wouldn't. Okay. Yes. Uh, but it's not the guy. if you look at artists at as a whole, they lose tremendously because songs are paid on radio for free. The proof of this is my wife and I were going to take an automobile trip to places where radio stations, especially music radio stations, wouldn't come in clearly. What's the first thing we did? We bought some CDs. And in fact, if you, if, if you can't get radio, that's one of the reasons to buy, uh, to, 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 to buy music that you're otherwise listening to uh, for free. Uh, we're told that there's a promo promotional value, but as the uh, chairman uh, points out, there's a promotional value to sports teams. They still get paid for their uh, rights. And of course, there's a promotional value to songwriters they still get paid for their rights. The best way to deal with the uh, promotional value argument is to have the rate board take it into consideration. And I'd point out, if there are garage bands that want to, they could just announce that their music can be played by radio for free. You could have whole radio stations that play nothing but free garage band music uh, and let them succeed and capture a market if they can. Um, and finally, of course, uh, much of the performance right is going to go to artists who are no longer touring, and the only way they'll benefit from their songs is uh, through uh, this, uh, 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 this performance right. So I look forward to passing this bill and uh, yield back. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, going in seniority order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield to the gentlelady from Texas. I thank the gentleman. Gentleman, gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. It's always good to, to be um, in a markup where there is a vigorous discussion, and Mr. Chairman and to Chairman Conyers, this has been a very positive discussion. I want to reflect positively on our new members' comments, which I appreciated very much uh, when he emphasized the term justice. Uh, and uh, I'd like to associate myself with Congressman Sherman's remark. I don't know how many people, even though I call the role of those who may not now be performing, that has been one of the issues is that uh, individuals are already performing and they're already benefiting, uh, but there is a whole uh, legacy of individuals who are no longer performing. Uh, one of the more striking uh, sad cases uh, that many of us know, he had a beautiful songbird type voice, was Jackie Wilson. And many of us know uh, the conditions in which he ultimately lived. Thinking about that and, and thinking about uh, trying to balance, I had uh, two amendments uh, that uh, I will explain, but I am going to hold in abeyance uh, because um, I believe that we are still talking. And I also believe that the amendment that I offered that is now the manager's amendment uh, that I understand was spoken to uh, by Mr. Lundgren asking for an early assessment, but I think we will have the appropriate time to really uh, take a look at uh, how this particular framework, again, I believe this is a framework uh, that speaks to the 1909 copyright bill, how it will work and how it may financially impact uh, minority, women-owned, uh, and uh, small stations. And I would uh, highlight KCOH, of which, again, I'm getting uh, BlackBerry messages from, uh, and, of course, um, uh, the prominent uh, Radio 1 stations in uh, Houston, the Box, magic uh, and praise. And of course, you see, I know that my name is, as my good friend uh, Congressman Waters indicated, they are very much our friends. So in thinking about this, I wanted to find uh, the right and appropriate balance 
to to be of help and i'm going to to work with our colleagues one of the amendments was to raise the five million dollar limit to ten million dollars to take into account the growth of these stations and to try to be responsive to them i'm going to hold in abeyance so that we can look at the numbers and the impact and how many stations are being impacted but i think it's a viable amendment particularly in this economy and i heard congressman kabul make the point about the economy though we know that the manager's amendment gives a one year extension a one year enactment one year out in akron for our large stations and a three year enactment for our smaller stations i think it is a very fair statement and then something that i think congress needs to do more often is to have provisions dealing with sunset i'm going to hold that in abeyance as well because i think that we can always come back and reassess the impact good bad or indifferent so that we can be fair to the performers and peer and fair to the radio stations the information as my good friend from georgia indicated that's being disseminated that speaks to the closing of black businesses in particular and i imagine it might be hispanic businesses of hispanic stations or own or asian or women or small businesses really i hope that they will listen to this discussion and see as i said in my early remarks a light at the end of the tunnel because that's what we are working to do and my amendments were to in essence be an extension of good faith that if we are too low on the amount of revenue because you have grown but yet you're small then that's something we should look at if we are making whole performers by five years in terms of a sunset provision then we should look at but i think the manager's amendment is a very fair compromise that has helped us move this bill forward uh... and uh... with that uh... i'm going to again hold in abeyance and not with the general lady i'd be happy to yield to the chairman uh, uh, yes thanks mr scott i'm his mr oh, scott this is scott's time uh, all i wanted to do was uh... thank the gentle lady for her thoughtfulness uh... everyone here has agreed this morning and afternoon that this is a work in progress that there isn't anyone striking a tone of finality uh, toward whatever happens here today. And I, I thank the gentlelady uh, from Houston, Texas, uh, who, who uh, like many other of us in the Congress, are beneficiaries of the stations uh, that uh, feel that they may be harmed by any work product that we put out. We want to assure everybody We've, 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 the manager's amendment is explicitly written to make sure that they don't get cut out. They weren't, we didn't want them to get cut out before there wasn't a manager's amendment. So this is very, very critical. And uh, uh, in, in Detroit, WCHB, uh, my friend Mildred Gaddis is on, uh, Tom Pope is blasting away all the time uh, uh, hopefully not at me but with us uh, and and these are all friends of ours this is a unique division of support because many of the friends uh, that are upset uh, they haven't seen the bill that is before us they don't even they didn't even know about the manager's amendment because it was only introduced two hours ago. And, and we think that and changing the time limits and some of the money amounts is, is going to open us up to being able to sit down and take this to a point where all parties will be in reasonable harmony. Will the gentleman Wait. yield? You, sir. I yield. Um, the, the, ta the gentleman from Virginia. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that, that the gentleman gets two additional minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you tell me, uh, Mr. Chairman, when this bill would go in effect if it was successful? Yes, ma'am. It, it has been postponed. It will not go into uh, effect were it to pass the House, the Senate, signed by the president it will not go into effect uh, for some 
it, uh, it'll be one year, but for the others, the smaller ones, it will be three years. Thank you, and that's what I thought um, the wording uh, basically said. I'm wondering, Mr. Chairman, uh, if in fact it's not going to go into effect uh, uh, until one year, or in some cases three years, and why not have uh, a study? Uh, yes. You're quite right. We should have a study. Why not then substitute a study for the bill until such time as we get the information back uh, and still you could be on track for your one year or your three year, but we would at least have additional information as described by Mr. Lundgren uh, so that we could do a better job of acting in the interest of both of the parties that are involved. The time of the gentleman of Virginia has expired. I ask you to consent that uh, the gentleman get two additional minutes. The gentleman is accorded two additional minutes. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, that's very, very kind of you. He's so kind. You, you didn't have to yield to me, but I appreciate it. Uh, the, the reason that we want to move forward on this is that the study and moving this bill forward are not dependent on one another. And what we're, we're hoping is that in this interim time, the parties will be able to come together, Maxine. This is an incredible uh, situation. We, we've never met with the parties to see if anything can be worked out. And that's, that's the only reason we're doing it both at the same time. The gentleman yield. Uh, Good lady from California. Yes, thank you very much. And I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say that uh, I have listened to uh, both sides talk about the non-negotiations or the partial negotiations. Some of us were not really involved in those negotiations. And, um, you know, the more we... Um, would we the, sit here and we talk about how much we regret would the that we had to take sides. I think that uh, we deserve an opportunity uh, to be involved in negotiations where we think we may have some impact. Would the gentleman yield? I'll, I'll yield. Since really two years ago, we have invited the National Association of Broadcasters to come in and work through any of these issues that they would be willing to do. They, it isn't that they aren't interested in the bill. We're hearing from the, just the comments today, they've been working very hard against the bill. But they have, as a matter of policy, refused to come in and, and, and talk to us. Will the uh, gentleman yield? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Berman, with all due respect, uh, you're absolutely right, and I think perhaps um, there has been a perception that they didn't stand a chance because they thought that um, too many people were uh, operating on behalf of the entertainment industry and that um, they would not stand a chance at negotiations. Now, uh, I think that's not true, and just because there are so many of us on this committee from California uh, who interact with the entertainment industry, we should not leave them with that impression. Would the gentleman yield? Well, um, I, want to I, want to I want to reserve 10 seconds so I can close my time. <laughs> well, then I'll give you a minute and 10 I'll, seconds. I'll, 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 uh, I'll unanimous yield. consent. Oh, you. I would suggest that I have a different interpretation. It is not that they thought that they couldn't work something out. It is that they believed fervently that they didn't need to work anything out, that they could stop this bill in the subcommittee or in the full committee or on the floor or in the Senate. And it was out of, uh, and it was, hmm? uh, and it was that that motivated the decision, not, uh, not the fear that we kept inviting them to come in. Uh, over and over again at every hearing, and we still do. Mr. Starting Chairman, the day after the bill passes. May I uh, get unanimous consent to yield to the gentleman from Virginia two more minutes uh, to engage in this very useful discussion? Uh, yeah, in about 20 of them, I'll be gone, but. Uh, <laughs> we just need two more minutes, okay. Mr. Chairman. 
This is the gentleman from Virginia. Uh, uh, in that case, the gentleman from Virginia, without unanimous consent, two more minutes. I yield. Well, the gentleman will, uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Berman, uh, your interpretation of the uh, intent of the broadcasters is one that you certainly uh, have a right to advance. However, in my most recent discussion with the broadcasters, that is not the interpretation that I'm left with. I am left with, again, what I attempted to describe, where they thought that they uh, did not have uh, a legitimate opportunity or chance to really advance their cause because they thought there was a tilt in the negotiations and those who were negotiating. I don't hold that opinion because I don't know. I was not involved. But I suppose what I'm asking at this time is that more people on this committee who would like to get involved in trying to bring these two sides together should have the opportunity to do that. I think that is not too much to ask, and I yield back to the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's appropriate that for based on the issue and the fact that some people may have been offended that the uh, views expressed on my time do not necessarily reflect <laughs> the views. <laughs> Before the gentleman yields back, this issue. before the gentleman yields back, I think you still have some more time. balance of my time to the gentlelady from Texas. I thank you. I think this was a, a vigorous and important uh, uh, discussion. Um, I think that um, uh, the more we have engaged in the discussion, um, uh, we will, uh, in essence, uh, get to the solution we'd like. For these reasons, Mr. Chairman, for these reasons. I'm holding in abeyance uh, the $10 million increase or the $5 million increase. I think it's a valuable amendment. And the idea of a sunset I think is valuable and would encourage the broadcasters uh, and all of us uh, to be at the table. This is the right thing to do, and I yield back. Time of the gen gentleman has expired. Uh, any, anyone else wish to speak? Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to attempt to be really brief. I'd like to uh, remark on a couple of points. We've covered everything under the universe, and we still have so many questions out there, and I think that's what troubles many of the members on this committee. When it comes to promotional value, first of all, no one is going to argue with the concept and the principle that everyone should be compensated for their labor. And there's no one on this committee, whether you're Republican or Democrat. That is really not the issue. And I, I will attempt to explain why I believe we're all in, in agreement with that. It's a matter of how we go forward in recognizing that compensation. There are many lawyers on this committee, and if I recall, there's different forms of payment, and that's why promotional value comes into play in the debate on what is the best relief to be provided or the remedy. In lieu of, how many of us, when we were lawyers or judges, heard so often, in lieu of, there wasn't just one form of payment. We ha it's an open question whether there really is promotional value that balances out the consideration to compensate that particular artist. That's first and foremost. Secondly, it has, if we all agree that it's been flawed, I will tell you what has been established on a flawed principle of promotional value in lieu of other type of compensation, and that is a radio station business model. And that is the reality. And times have changed. Right now, economic times are bad. You have decreased revenues on advertising because that's the only way they stay in business. So we say, well, let's just not have an effective date, which is an acknowledgment that we don't know the economic impact and consequences of what we are doing. There's something else happening out there. The world has changed. And there are different platforms by which artists are promoted and music is played, listened to, and purchased. And many of those platforms, many of those competitors of your traditional radio stations don't even have the added cost of providing for that platform uh, infrastructure. Now we can say, well, there are a lot of unanswered questions. This will simply acknowledge the copyright the proprietary right, but it really does more than that. Let me explain why. These businesses still have to operate in the real world of capital markets. How do you value your business when this is hanging over your head and it's an unknown? You want to buy a station? You want to sell a station? You want to go to your banker? How do you explain what your exposure is going to be? 
you don't think bankers are going to be looking as what is the potential exposure? The truth is we don't have the answers at this point in time. I want everyone that goes into making a song, a song, a recording, a recording to be compensated. The question is, which is the best way to do it? Now, I have joined other colleagues in a letter to the GAO, and we have eight or nine questions. And I think that Ms. Waters is pointing out a very important point, as well as my colleague from Utah. Without those answers, should we be moving forward? Because I think this is more than something that is just symbolic in recognizing a legal right. It places something in motion. And these business models that are out there attempting to operate in most difficult times and within a new competitive environment are at a tremendous disadvantage. I'm going to end it with what appeared in my local newspaper yesterday. And these are the big boys. I'm not talking about some little operation. Advertising revenues have fallen for both companies in making reference. Both companies were hit with costs associated with layoffs this year totaling 12% of their workforce. In January 2009, the company eliminated 1,850 jobs. In late April, another 590 people in the radio unit were laid off, mostly in the engineering, information, technology, and programming areas. That is the reality. And for us to simply say that this is just acknowledging the principle is, I think, inaccurate. And I think there's tremendous unintended consequences, but they're not in, in, uh, unintended. I think they can be anticipated. That which can be anticipated is not unintended. And I yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yield. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could, could I ask, uh, could I yield to Brad Chairman because I know why he wants to respond a little bit to Judge Gonzalez because he, he made a point or two that was relevant to what he was saying. I would just say, if we're going to wait for the time when the future can be known and businesses can be accurately valued in order to pass legislation, then Congress ought to save the country a lot of money and just go out of business. The fact is, radio sta to value a radio station, you would have to know uh, or you would have to deal with uncertainties like what is the future of the economy going to be? What are advertisers going to do? How is iPad and satellite radio going to affect what people decide to listen to in their cars? Uh, okay. And, and there's no way that we can uh, wait until these huge uncertainties in valuing a radio station are dealt with, let alone the more modest uncertainty created by this bill. Thanks, Brad Sherman. Now, I would like to invite our dearest friend and sister Maxine Waters to lead up among the members the negotiating committee that will be sitting down with uh, all of these various parties and, and uh, uh, nobody on this committee will be excluded. The other point that, that should be made clear in all this discussion is this, that this bill uh, is about uh, the right of compensation. Judge Gonzalez said everybody agrees on that. If everybody agreed on it, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't need a bill. Everybody does not agree that there should be fair compensation because historically there never has been. Now the study that keeps being referred to is about the rate. It isn't about compensation, it's about the rate of compensation. Those are two very clearly uh, distinct issues, and, and I hope that, that this discussion uh, led so ably uh, by uh, our dear friend uh, in the chair now will, will help us uh, move this forward on all the rails that it's on, a study a bill that establishes the right and the continued negotiation, the, the initial negotiations, which ironically we've never had. Mr. Chairman, will you yield? It's of course. Thank you very much. I certainly would accept that challenge. I wonder if uh, along with that challenge means that, uh, of course, uh, what, I, what I asked was that uh, we do not take a vote on this bill today and that um, we delay it uh, for further discussions and, you know, a study 
So does it does that come with the challenge for me to head up uh, negotiations as we continue? Well, are you asking me? Oh, I'm Wh asking which the chairman. chairman are you referring I'm, to? There's only one chairman of this committee, uh, Mr. Conyers. Well, let's have a vote on whether we should do that or not. Because if you if you want to hold up the vote, your vote, uh, a person that would want to do that wouldn't vote in the affirmative. So, uh, would you like me to shape some wording? Uh, would that be appropriate uh, to uh, advance that, uh, at place a motion at this time, or would that be inappropriate? No, it, it, you know, Maxine, nothing you do is inappropriate. That's not true. Most of what I do, <laughs> people say is inappropriate. Well, n nothing that I would ever say in public would, would be described as inappropriate. So now, all, all I want to do is we have this bill on the schedule, the agenda. I can't imagine what kind of language could be put on a piece of paper eight and a half by 11 inches in size that would allow us to delay this vote. Well, um, I want to thank the minority for, as they say on that Saturday Night Live skit, letting us talk among ourselves. Um, and uh, uh, at this point, we have, we have, we have, Two more members on our side, I believe, who seek recognition. Gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'll be very brief because, as you know, uh, one of our committee members, Linda Sanchez, had a baby this morning. And not that the hearing has gone on a long time, but the baby has now learned to walk and play the banjo. <laughs> uh, so if I go over 60 seconds, please cut me off with a gavel. Um, and I the baby has a right to be compensated. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the baby is with us, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the fact that we don't compensate performers and the owners of copyright for sound recordings and terrestrial broadcasts is an anachronism. Not only is it inconsistent with how we treat digital transmissions, but it's inconsistent with how terrestrial broadcasts is treated by the rest of the world. The fact that it is an anachronism hasn't made it any easier to correct, but in the interest of equity and the interest of harmonizing our laws with those around the world, it makes a great deal of sense. There have been some concerns raised with the bill, and I want to compliment uh, both Chairman Conyers and Chairman Berman for addressing many of them in the manager's amendment. I'd also like to thank uh, both chairmen for including language in the base bill that clarifies that license fees payable for public performance of sound recordings can't be cited or taken into account or otherwise used to set or adjust the license fees to be paid for public performance rights earned by others. This is very important to songwriters, among others, and I appreciate the work that went into that provision. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for raising the issue and moving it forward. I support the measure and urge that we take it up for a vote. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. The time of the gentleman has expired. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the, into the, the nature of a Oh, all right. So then we will. Thank you. Question occurs on the manager's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, the manager's amendment is adopted. Mr. Chairman, I Are there any I further amendments? I have an amendment, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman is recognized. <coughs> Clerk will read. Amendment to H.R. 848 offered by Mr. Daniel E. Lundgren of California. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the gentleman is recognized on his amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, um, both to you and to the chairman of the committee, let me uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge the extent to which you have sought to accommodate many of the concerns expressed about the base bill uh, during and after the hearing on the legislation. So I don't want my amendment in any way to be interpreted as disregarding that good faith effort. At the same time, as has uh, been displayed here, questions remain as to the ultimate impact of the bill before us this morning. The manager's amendment just adopted creates a tiered system based on gross revenue. Without greater knowledge concerning the variable and fixed costs associated with the broadcasting business, I have serious questions about the impact of this approach on large and small stations alike. I also have some difficulty in determining the basis for charging a small broadcaster with gross receipts of $500,000 per year, a fee of $5,000, $500,000 per year, a fee of $5,000, whereas a public station 
with a multiple of that revenue level would pay only $1,000 in its annual fee. Surely I would hope we would have more evidence before writing such a distinction into the law. Not having any opportunity in the business end of radio broadcasting, I am not in a position to judge how many stations in the U.S. would be required to pay royalties, nor do I know how they would be impacted. Would they convert to other formats, such as talk radio? Would some cease to operate entirely? What would a possible decline in the number of music stations mean for up-and-coming artists? Will those artists be able to negotiate freely with broadcasters? And of course, the most basic question for our discussion today, how should we measure the true value of broadcasters and performers alike? Uh, Judge Gonzalez was, was uh, very much on point when he talked about in lieu, that is, is there a payment already being made that is expressed in the value of the broadcast? Uh, all of us as members of Congress, when we run for election or re-election, uh, are charged for the broadcast of our commercials. Presumably we pay that because there is some value in that broadcast. That is in, in, in a very real sense a measure of that value. A fundamental question before us today, which I don't think we can answer, is whether or not we can always assume that the value of playing a song on a radio station will always be worth less than the value of the song. This is the assumption built into the legislation, which may or may not be valid in every case. And, and there has been the suggestion this bill doesn't go into effect for several years. In fact, it goes into effect when the president signs it because that establishes the right that establishes the presumption that in every case, the value of playing the song on the radio station is worth less than the value of the song. I'm concerned that we may not be capturing the whole picture here today, and I would say this with the greatest respect for our performing artists. And in fact, because of that respect, we need to be careful we don't kill the proverbial goose. Bobby Columby of uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears perhaps captured this concern best with his observation. In answer to the question, how important is radio to you, well, that is it. What you're doing is you're advertising. So he saw a definite value in the broadcast of his performances. Another element of concern to me came up during our hearing when I had the opportunity to ask Billy Corrigan about the impact of this legislation on up-and-coming performers. And although Smashing Pumpkins may not be my favorite flavor of music, they're clearly a popular and successful group with a following. So maybe they should be compensated for the playing of their music. However, there are a lot of real no-name bands out there that may be good, may be talented, that need a chance to have their music playing on the radio. That is a make-or-break moment for them. But if we're now going to require stations to pay for performances, is it less likely or more likely that up-and-coming, untested artists will be played, or will the, the already established artists be the ones more likely to be paid because you are actually then purchasing, if you will, an already known quantity? So while I'm fairly certain the Smashing Pumpkin will make out okay, I, I don't know what the impact would be on the up-and-coming artists. Given that the legislation raises almost as, as many questions as it resolves, it just seems to me it would make sense that we try and have more information before we vote on it. If, in fact, it's not going to go into effect in three years, why not adopt my amendment, which basically says we have the report. It must come back to us in six months. At that point in time, we can take up this bill in its entirety with the information that uh, is requested. My amendment would instruct GAO to conduct a study to determine the impact of the proposed legislation on local communities, on radio broadcasters and their stations, and on artists and the recording industry. It requires that there be a, a finding of what the uh, value of the performance uh, uh, to the performer of the broadcast so that we might have some comparison of the um, balancing uh, values. The study would have to be completed within six months. Then we could make an objective and I think better informed and equitable decision regarding the Well, the gentleman yield. Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to yield the gentlelady. Well, thank you very much. Um, would it be too much to ask that you uh, ask unanimous consent to add to the study the uh, impact on minority 
uh, owned radio stations also. I thought that was. Uh, I didn't hear that uh, in your description. I thought that would be implicit, but but yes, I I would ask unanimous consent that uh, we include on um, uh, page or, or line nine radio broadcasters in their in state in their stations, including the specific impact on minority-owned uh, stations. Without objection, the. Uh, Suggested amendment is incorporated into Mr. Chairman, oh, Mr. in front Chairman, of us. I, I, Mr. Chairman, I, can I withdraw my reservation of the point of order? Yes. Thank I you. I thank the gentleman for doing that. And, and I would just ask that we not put the cart before the horse. I would hope that we could be more informed. Uh, I know some would say, well, what you're trying to do is to stop this bill or to delay it unnecessarily. That is not my intent. That's why I have a six month um, requirement that the GAO come back and report to us. Uh, I would, I would feel much better being on better ground with better facts to be able to compare the arguments that have been made to me. And I think there are valid arguments on both sides. And so I would ask for support time. of this amendment. The time the gentleman has expired, I'll recognize myself for a, a very short response. I urge a no vote on this amendment. Uh, by striking everything else in the bill and leaving this GAO study, a study which the chairman of the committee and a number of other members, a bipartisan group of members, have already requested of the GAO. Uh, there is no other interpretation that this amendment, in effect, kills, uh, kills the substance of this bill, if not the number of this bill. Uh, perhaps somebody can introduce a bill sometime later uh, that deals with the substance. I would argue uh, the, the gentleman is operating from a zero-sum game model that doesn't apply anywhere else in the world, and that is if something values the performer, other people, uh, the use of it, other people, they, people who want to use it don't have to pay for it, even if it, it does value them. That's the logic of assuming that there is a zero rate, which may be a, a appropriate. Uh, the right of compensation was critical here. I'm totally prepared. Uh, under the general lady from California's uh, auspices or any other auspices to work with, and I think the chairman of the committee is also, to work regarding rate determinations and factors in determining the rate. But why, why the owners of sound recordings and the recording artists and the backup singers and the musicians should be the only single group of people whose creativity is entitled to be exempted from any compensation uh, just uh, defies uh, to me uh, any sense of justice or fairness, and I urge a no vote on this. Would the gentleman Chairman. yield? Would the gentleman yield? On the amendment. No, no, no. Would the gentleman yield? I mean, it's well, I, I've given up my time, and uh, he, the, gentle, the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support this amendment. I think that Congress should not act on this bill until we have relevant information of its likely impact on all those that it would potentially affect. I do think we have an obligation to take the time necessary and to gather the facts before we act too hastily. And Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'd also say, think that this is a good precedent. This would be applicable to all legislation. Uh, we certainly uh, have seen in recent months where this committee has acted and we've run into the law of unintended consequences. I think we do know the, need to know the value of various components of this legislation, so I agree uh, with the amendment that's been offered by the gentleman from California, and I will yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from California. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I would just like to respond to my friend from California. This is not an attempt by me to kill this bill. If, if Look, I'm not in the majority, I'm in the minority. I can't, uh, I can't determine when bills are brought up, but if, as a gesture of goodwill, I will happily put my name as a co-sponsor to the bill to help get it up after the six months. Uh, if that's what uh, it takes to show that I am uh, specifically interested in not killing the bill but allowing us to make a determination. Now, I may make a decision based on the information that's brought forward by the report that this is not a bill to support, but I will do whatever the gentleman uh, would ask me to do to ensure that we bring this back up for immediate consideration upon the receipt of the report. Uh, it is not my intent to kill the legislation. It is my intent to have information 
so that we can make a more informed judgment as to whether this is the appropriate legislation. And so uh, I understand the earnestness with which the gentleman um, has pursued this particular bill, uh, but I hope he does not mischaracterize my interest. I believe Would there the are viable uh, meritorious arguments on both sides, and I think it is our obligation to try and find the best way out of this oh, yeah. uh, with the facts uh, presented to us. So, would the, the, the ranking member yield to me? Yes, be happy to yield, Mr. Chairman. Um, th this is a unique uh, circumstance that we're confronted with. Uh, the gentleman introduces a, a bill, I won't say gut, I'm not going to use that term but it removes everything but from the bill except a study that hasn't been enacted. And he says, and if, if circumstances are right, if the moon is in the right alliance with the stars, he may join us on introducing another bill. Isn't that what I heard you say? Well, it's, I, I used prose, the gentleman used uh, poetry. Uh, <laughs> But what I was trying to suggest is my in look, I'm not in the majority. I don't control what you bring up. You can bring up whatever you want to, as you know. My point is my effort is not to in any way stymie the majority from bringing it up. My point is that both the majority and the minority members here who have engaged in a vigorous discussion would have a better basis upon which we would complete this bill. And if, in fact, under the terms of the bill as it now stands, I've been told it won't go into effect for most parties till f for three years and for some for one year. What is the problem with waiting for six months to get information upon which we can make a better informed judgment? Uh, Mr. Smith, if you'd yield, uh, because the people who are the beneficiaries of this bill have been waiting for 60 years. That's why I don't want to wait for six months. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll yield back. Mr. All Chairman, right. on the amendment? Yes. The gentlelady from California, Maxine. I find Moore. myself in a most unusual position agreeing with the gentleman from California, which I don't think I've ever done before. And I well, support. Yeah, you might get used to it. I don't think so. <laughs> um, I support the amendment uh, because, uh, as you know, I focus a lot of my work on trying to preserve minority institutions. It is not simply uh, radio stations, but it's banks, on and on and on. And what we find in this industry is uh, that um, minority radio stations are being bought up uh, because um, the revenue that um, many of our uh, owners are able to achieve are just not there increasingly. And uh, I do not wish, I do not wish uh, for us to uh, be in a position where, where our actions will further undermine minority stations and put them out of business. And I want you to know when there are these mergers and these buyouts that the formats change anyway. And the formats change in ways that do not protect particularly our older performers are those who, um, if they were heard, perhaps others would go out and remember and buy those records, or they could pass down, uh, you know, that art form, that work, et cetera, et cetera. So my interest in uh, supporting this delay is to see what I can do, since you've given me the challenge, to see what I can do to get involved in this discussion in order to honor the performers and also preserve these minority stations and not look up a year or two from now with few minority stations who cannot support talk radio because they don't have uh, ownership anymore. So that's what I want to put on the, the record. Thank the you very much. I yield back the balance of Will the gentleman yield? Or yes, woman I will yield. yield. Yes. Uh, I, I want to thank you for your comments and your, your, your boldness in standing up for this. I truly do believe in my heart of hearts, Mr. Chairman, that that the performers have a right to own their product. I really do believe that. I think they should be in, in control of, of their destiny and they ought to be compensated for that. But as we are changing this significant model, we understand that the performers offer a value, but the broadcasters also offer a value. 
but I don't believe in un, I don't I don't believe any of us understand what the value of each party brings to the table. And while we've waited for so long, I do think it's prudent to understand the value that each party brings to the table. I would hope that they could just work it out, but they've been unable to do that. Uh, but I think this body helping to push it in that direction, I would support uh, this amendment. I would support uh, Ms. Waters uh, in her quest. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity and yield back the balance of my time. But will, will the gentleman yield? Well, I, I just want to make, I think the gentleman makes a good point, except he forgets something that, frankly, if the marketplace was going to decide the value of this thing, like when the New York Mets want to negotiate whether to have their thing broadcast, it helps them because it promotes their product. It allows them to advertise for other things at the stadium. They are empowered to enter into a negotiation. No one would imagine the idea of saying that a broadcaster can just show up at, at Shea Stadium and just start broadcasting and that that's just this tough luck. The problem is that theoretically any piece of legislation ever passed by Congress, you can waive this amendment and say, hey, let's just wait and study it a little more. I have to tell you, I'm opposed to it for another reason. We have outsourced so much around here. The CBO gets to stop things from coming to the floor if they score it a certain way. We, you know, we, we, we have to start, after a while, you have hearings, you debate it, you talk about it, you mark up a bill, and in this case, you wait 60 years, and then you act. I think, frankly, you know, I think we've pretty much gone through that cycle pretty well, 60 years and six months. I don't think it adds all that much value. Reclaiming my time. If there's any left, reclaiming my time, I yield back, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. The question occurs. Mr. Chairman. Who said that? I'm down here at the end. I'm on this side. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm on this. <laughs> uh, the gentleman, uh, for what purpose does he seek recognition? No, it's me. Oh, the gentlelady from Texas. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee is yeah. recognized. Th this very same amendment was uh, discussed uh, uh, previously in. Um, in fact, um, we had an amendment that would track this language, but I think it's important to note that the letter that is being sent um, to uh, the GAO uh, gives the gentleman from California the information that he asked for, uh, and I would hope that we don't dismiss the letter, and I would ask unanimous consent uh, to submit uh, the letter uh, to uh, the United States uh, Government Accountability Office uh, into the record, uh, which will give a long list of questions of financial viability about these stations uh, and ask for its immediate response or immediate response uh, from uh, the GAO. I think the gentleman from New York's point is well taken. Uh, we seem to always ask others to give us answers, but I think in this instance it's very important. I'd ask you Would the gentle lady yield to me, please? I'd be happy to yield. Uh, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, there, there are three points to consider as we close the debate. Number one, if you don't want a bill that establishes the right, I haven't heard anybody say yet that artists don't have a right to be compensated. But I've heard a number of people say they don't want a bill yet that establishes that right. The second point you must consider is that the study deals only with the rate. The study does not deal with the right. And point number three is that the gentlelady from California has accepted the role of bringing the parties together and allowing all members of the committee who may have thought for some reason they were excluded the only reason they were excluded is that there was nothing to negotiate. Now, hopefully, we'll have something to negotiate. And finally, let me say this. If you really want to gut the bill, vote for the amendment. It's quite simple. If you really want to move the ball down the court, we've got a lot of time. The Senate, the other body, do you know, uh, anybody know what they're going to do with this bill yet? I don't. Uh, we got to go to the Rules Committee. Uh, we will have plenty of time to negotiate with the parties amongst ourselves and, and get any uh, real or imagined details that you may need to uh, justify your decision. Mr. Chairman, 
I, if I may, if you will yield for clarification, the general lady from California. Uh, oh, your time. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, the general lady from California accepted the challenge. Yes. However, it was not a challenge instead of. <laughs> this was a challenge that would be based on not moving this bill today. I'm perfectly willing to work on it, but my number one priority is to slow this train down and to give us an opportunity to deal with the study so that we will know the impacts that have been articulated by the gentleman from uh, California. So I just want to make that clarification. I yield back to the lady. Ms. Jackson lady. Lee, I, I have to uh, uh, get a point of clarification. I yield to the gentleman. If, if the gentle lady is saying she will take the leadership on negotiation only if we vote this bill down, I will accept her resignation from the committee. The gentleman, the chairman, uh, with all due respect, uh, cannot accept the resignation the when uh, there's been the negotiating a committee. Ms. Chairman, I want to be clear that my involvement is not a substitute for a study that has been offered by the gentleman from California. I appreciate the challenge, but I don't want the chairman to assign to me anything that would appear to be um, a substitute for this study. Now, of course, I may engage after this, but yes, my leadership and involvement in negotiations is conditioned on stop slowing down the train today. Reclaiming my time, uh, let me, um, if I might add to the clarification, uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, the passage or non-passage of the bill will depend on the members here in this room. But the idea of moving forward gets all parties to the table. I would hope that all of us would part of those negotiations. I'd hope that the record would show that we are not for closing any business, minority, women-owned, African-American, Hispanic, Asian, or the world. But what we are for is giving credibility to the talent, the sweat, the blood, the tears, those who've died not getting the right in terms of their just compensation for the essence of their talent, their spirit. I think it's valuable. The gentleman's amendment was just like mine uh, that we have now put in a letter. Uh, I also have language in the manager's amendment that deals specifically with minority and women-owned businesses. And believe me, we're getting hits hard. I don't know how long they're going to be on our radio stations and elsewhere. Why don't we try an opportunity for meeting together because this bill is not on the floor of the House tomorrow, it's probably not on next week, and we can work with the Senate and work with those who are interested in coming to the wonderful compromise of keeping our businesses' doors open, which they will, and respecting those whose talent and art we have. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. The uh, vote now occurs on the Lundgren Amendment. All those that are in support of it indicate by saying aye. All those who are opposed to it indicate by saying no. 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 Recorded the, vote. The, uh, the, all right. A recorded vote is, is, is ordered, and the clerk will call the roll, please. Mr. Conyers? No. Mr. Conyers votes no. Mr. Berman? Mr. Boucher? Mr. Nadler? Mr. Scott? Mr. Watt? Ms. Lofgren, Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee, Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Ms. Waters, Ms. Waters votes aye. Mr. Delahunt, Mr. Delahunt votes no. Mr. Wexler, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Pierre Louisi, Mr. Quigley, Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Gutierrez. Mr. Sherman, Mr. Sherman votes no. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Weiner, Mr. Schiff, Mr. Schiff votes no. Ms. Sanchez, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mr. Maffei, Mr. Maffei votes no. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith votes aye. Mr. Gutlatt. Mr. Gutlatt votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes no. Mr. Koble. Mr. Koble votes aye. Mr. Lundgren. 
Mr. Lundgren votes aye. Mr. Issa? Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Forbes? Mr. Forbes votes no. Mr. King? Mr. Franks? Mr. Franks votes no. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Poe? Mr. Poe votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Rooney? Mr. Rooney votes no. Mr. Harper? Mr. Harper votes aye. Mr. Weiner, Mr. Mr. Nadler, votes no. Mr. Nadler votes no. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott votes no. <clears throat> Mr. Berman, Chairman, Mr. Berman votes no. Are there any members that choose to cast a ballot? Yes, sir. I don't know if, well, yes, okay. <laughs> Mr. Franks votes aye. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, 10 members voted aye, 19 members voted no. The gentleman, oh, wait, wait a minute. Is it Mr. Yes. Wexler? The clerk will re-report. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, 10 members voted aye, 20 members voted nay. Uh, the amendment is unsuccessful. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 848 offered by Mr. Poe of Texas. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the distinguished gentleman is recognized in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've been talking about who gets paid and who doesn't get paid, um, and there's been a lot of discussion about that today. Uh, reminds me sort of like when I was a judge in court, and some lawyers obviously uh, should be paying the jury to have to listen to them and uh, they were getting paid, of course, by their clients. But be that as it may, I serve in an area that we have small radio stations uh, that are struggling. I also uh, represent uh, some folks in the artist industry, Tracy Bird and Clay Walker, and Willie Nelson's a friend of mine. Those are probably not performers that you hear up in De Detroit very much, Mr. Chairman, but they are very popular in my area. Um, it seems to me that the one group we haven't talked about that is getting paid, no matter what happens on this uh, bill, are the uh, record label, the record label industry. There are four record label uh, companies that exist. Uh, three of those uh, are foreign companies: uh, Universal, which is a French record label; Sony, BMG is Japanese and German; and EMI, which is British. The only American one is Warner that is left uh, in the industry. Uh, so this uh, amendment uh, takes the record industry, record label, uh, out of the, uh, out of the uh, legislation and turns that money over to the performers. Uh, the non-featured performers will get 10% of the uh, revenue and then performing artists will get 90% of the revenue. The record label industry will not get a cut uh, because uh, it should go if, that's, if the plan is that this uh, bill help performers, then it should go to the performers and not the record label uh, corporation. Um, with that, uh, I would uh, urge the adoption of this amendment to uh, uh, restructure it so that uh, performers uh, receive the 50 percent that now will go to the uh, rec record labels. And with that, I'll yield. Would you, gentlemen, you? I'll yield. Uh, and I appreciate the gentleman's amendment, but since we have an original member of the Four Tops, what you're saying to performers is reach out and I'll be there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Wexler, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just wanted to respectfully uh, strike the last word and speak 
Gentleman is recognized. Speak in opposition to Mr. Poe's amendment. And I, I just want to make it clear, and I, I think it, it applies to both myself and to most, if not all, members of the committee. We very much support the efforts of the performers. Most of the very eloquent words that many of my colleagues uh, talked about in terms of the manager's amendment were addressed for the purpose of ensuring that performers, in fact, are compensated for their, for their efforts, for their professional efforts. Um, if I understand Mr. Poe's amendment properly, uh, if it were adopted, uh, it would require that uh, all of the royalties paid under the bill go straight to the performers and not to the record label. Um, that might be attractive to some, however, the truth is it's the record labels who are the actual owners of the rights. And it would be illogical to pass a bill that would suggest that those who own the rights would not receive compensation at all. The, the bill, as we are now considering it, uh, divides the royalties to ensure for compensation, fair compensation. But to deny the owners of the rights any compensation whatsoever, uh, I don't think is a principle that this committee should embrace, not under any circumstance. If, if there is an apt analogy, uh, I think it, the apt analogy with respect to Mr. Poe's amendment would, would be that uh, DJs receive all of the royalties paid in the context of a radio station and a radio station not receive any of it. Um, that I don't think would be a particularly fair solution and nor is the solution fair that is proposed by this amendment. Um, so on, on the grounds that while we all support the performers, and, and that we do and I certainly have for many, many years, um, the idea that we would pass an amendment that would ensure that all of the royalties would go to performers rather than recognizing the legitimate ownership rights that record labels have, and at the same time recognizing that the owners of those rights have the responsibility to divide the compensation fairly, that's what the bill does. But this amendment would change that calculation dramatically, and that's why I oppose it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The question is on the poll amendment. Those members that are supportive indicate by saying aye. Aye. And those uh, members that are opposed indicate by saying no. 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 Uh, the amendment is unsuccessful. Uh, we, we now move to uh, report the bill HR 848 of reporting quorum being present. The question is on reporting the bill uh, as amended favorably to the House. Those in favor say uh, aye. Aye. aye, aye. Those opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. The bill as amended is ordered, reported favorably. Yes, Mr. Simpson Bennett, a recorded vote is demanded. Clerk will call. Mr. Conyers. Aye. Mr. Conyers votes aye. Mr. Berman. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Nadler. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott votes aye. Mr. Watt? Aye. Mr. Watt votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Ms. Waters? Aye. Ms. Waters votes no. Mr. Delahunt? Aye. Mr. Delahunt votes aye. Mr. Wexler? Mr. Wexler votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson? Mr. Johnson votes yes. Mr. Pierre Luizzi. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Gutierrez. Mr. Sherman. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Sherman votes aye. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes aye. Mr. Maffei. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith votes no. Mr. Goodlatte. Mr. Sensenbrenner. 
Mr. Sensenbrenner votes aye. Mr. Coble? Mr. Coble votes no. Mr. Galligley? Mr. Lundgren? Mr. Lundgren votes no. Mr. Isa? Ms. Mr. Isa votes yes. Mr. Forbes? Mr. King? Mr. Franks? Mr. Gomert? Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Jo Mr. Gomert votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Poe? Mr. Poe votes no. Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Rooney? Mr. Rooney votes yes. Mr. Harper? Mr. Harper votes no. Are there other members present? Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes aye. Mr. Berman. Mr. Berman votes aye. Mr. Forbes. Mr. Forbes votes aye. Mr. Goodlatte. Mr. Goodlatte votes aye. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, 21 members voted aye, nine members voted nay. The bill is ag agreed to and uh, without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating amendments adopted and the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Members will have two days to submit Votes. We have two quick measures. Uh, the clerk will call up pursuant to notice H.R. 2344 and report the bill. H.R. 2344, a bill to amend Section 114 of Title 17, United States Code, to provide for agreements for the reproduction and performance of sound recordings by webcast. Without objection, the bill is considered as read. Uh, my opening statement will be put in the record. The bill without objection. The bill allows the recording industry and the providers of internet radio, uh, known as webcasters, to negotiate reasonable royalty rates for the streaming of sound and recording, for sound recordings on the internet. I yield to uh, Lamar Smith. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support this bill and ask unanimously since that my statement be made a part of the record. Without objection, uh, so ordered. Uh, are there any amendments? If not, uh, all those uh, reporting quorum uh, uh, being present, uh, all those uh, favorably uh, disposed to reporting the bill will say aye. aye. All those opposed will say no. The bill is uh, agreed to favorably. Good job, Ray. And, uh, Without objection, we'll be, we'll, the members will have two days to submit their additional views. The clerk is instructed, pursuant to notice, to call up 1741, the Witness Security and Protection Grant Program. The clerk will report H.R. 1741. H.R. 1741, a bill to require the Attorney General to make competitive grants to eligible state, tribal, and local prosecutors to establish and maintain certain protection and witness assistance programs. Uh, the chair will recognize Subcommittee Chairman Scott of Virginia to make the initial uh, statement of, in support of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 1741, the Witness Security and Protection Act of 2007 was introduced by the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. It authorizes the Attorney General to award grants to states and local prosecu prosecutors for establishing and improving short-term witness protection programs for witnesses that are involved in state or local trials involving a homicide, serious felony, or a serious drug offense. Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I have a, um, an amendment to change the uh, 
recipient to local and state governments rather than the prosecutors because they can better handle the grants. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes Lamar Smith. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I support this legislation. I ask unanimous consent that my statement be made a part of the record, but I also have to uh, raise a, a point that I'm not sure we have a reporting quorum. And uh, could you check on that, Mr. Chairman? We'll call a record vote on final passage. Okay. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Scott for an amendment. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1741 offered by Mr. Scott of Virginia. Uh, without objection, the bill will be considered as read. And the gentleman for Virginia is recognized in support of his amendment. Mr. Chairman, this is the amendment I referred to in my opening remarks. I would uh, hope that we'd adopt the amendment to change the uh, recipient of the grants to state and local governments who can better administer the grants and local prosecutors who probably would not be as able. I yield back. Uh, does any, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, do you have any uh, view about this uh, amendment? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support the amendment. Yield back. Uh, are there any other discussion on the amendment? If not, those in favor of the Scott Amendment indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The amendment is successful. And if are there any further amendments? If if not, uh, we will have a record vote to determine the presence of a quorum so that we can report the bill. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Conyers? Present. Mr. Conyers, present. Mr. Berman? The point of parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman? Is this a recorded vote on, on no. passage? It, no, it's, it's a quorum it call. Well, to determine the presence of a quorum so we can have a vote. Parliamentary inquiry, could we just? Hmm? Okay, uh, we can go straight to a recorded vote. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to re withdraw the request for a qu reporting a quorum, and uh, w we will uh, call have a record vote on final passage and determine a quorum at the same time. Mr. Conyers? Aye. Mr. Conyers votes aye. Mr. Berman? Mr. Boucher, Mr. Nadler, aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye, Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott votes aye, Mr. Watt, Ms. Lofgren, Ms. Lofgren votes aye, Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye, Ms. Waters, Ms. Waters votes aye, Mr. Delahunt, Mr. Wexler, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Pierre Luisi, Mr. Quigley, Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Gutierrez, Mr. Sherman, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Weiner, Mr. Schiff, Ms. Sanchez, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Mr. Maffei, Mr. Maffei votes aye. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith votes aye. Mr. Goodlatte, Mr. Sensenbrenner, Mr. Sensenbrenner votes no. Mr. Coble, Mr. Galligly, Mr. Lundgren, Mr. Lundgren votes aye. Mr. Isa, Mr. Forbes, Mr. King, Mr. Franks, Mr. Gomert, Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Poe, Mr. Poe votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz, Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Rooney, Mr. Harper, Mr. Harper votes aye. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes aye. Mr. Delahunt. Mr. Delahunt votes Mr. aye. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman votes aye. Mr. Poe. 
Under these circumstances, uh, we will suspend the vote uh, and, and have it uh, called later. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I ask the clerk, pursuant to notice, to call up H.R. 2247, the Congressional Review Act, uh, Review Act Improvement Act, for purposes of markup. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 2247, a bill to amend Title V, United States Code, to make technical amendments to certain provisions of Title V, United States Code, enacted by the Congressional Review Act. Without uh, uh, objection, the bill will be considered as read. And I would like the chair of the Commercial and Administrative Law Subcommittee, Steve Cohen of Tennessee, to make the opening statement. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Congressional Review Act was an attempt by Congress to reassert some control over the agency rulemaking process. While the CRA's effect, effect, efficacy with respect to that goal is debatable, we can be certain that implementing its review process has been particularly burdensome on the House and Senate parliamentarians. The CRA currently requires all agencies promulgating a rule to submit to both houses of Congress and the Comptroller General of the Government Accountability Accountability Office, a report that contains a copy of the rule, a concise general statement describing the rule, and the proposed effective date of the rule, thus including the copy kept at the originating agency. Current law declares that some that same material be submitted, housed, and printed at four different government agencies. Trees are suffering, and Congress comes to the rescue. H.R. 2247, the Congressional Review Act Improvement Act, would cut government waste by reducing duplicative paperwork and relieving some of the administrative burdens currently mandated by the CRAs. H.R. 2247 would eliminate the requirement that agencies submit rules that are published in the Federal Register at each House of Congress. Instead of receiving the full submission of each individual rule, the House and Senate receive a weekly list of all rules from the GAO's Comptroller General. The House and Senate would then enter that list in the congressional record of the statement of referral for each rule. Under these provisions, the agency would still be required to submit rules and reports to each House of Congress that were not printed in the Federal Register, and Congress would still employ the procedures in the CRA to disapprove agency rules. Last year, this committee favorably reported a bill identical to H.R. 2247 to the full House by voice vote with no amendments offered. The House then passed this bill on suspension by voice vote. I urge my colleagues to once again support these common sense modifications of the Congressional Review Act and make all the gnomes happy. And I want to specifically thank Chairman Conyers, Ranking Member Smith, and the Subcommittee Ranking Member, Mr. Franks, for their co-sponsorship of this legislation. We, we thank uh, Chair Steve Cohen for his environmental concerns. Deeply appreciate it. The Chair recognizes Lamar Smith. Mr. Chairman, I support the bill and ask unanimous consent that my statement be made a part of the record. Uh, are there any other comments or any amendments? In the absence of a, a working quorum or a reporting quorum, uh, the committee has no other alternative but to stand adjourned. And thank the Mr. Chairman. Yes, it Mr. Would, Scott. Is the previous vote still open, or was yes, it, it is still open, sir? Okay. Has anybody come in that did not had not already voted? No. Okay. Unfortunately, I I, I want to thank all the members. Uh, par yes. Parliamentary inquiry. I wonder if at the next vote, 
the committee might briefly convene in the Rayburn room and cast our votes there on these two. It has issues. never worked effectively All in right. my whole career. I've done it, but only at a subcommittee <laughs> level. Well, you have more power over your subcommittee <laughs> than I have over my full committee. The committee stands adjourned.